Aye. Call the meeting to order. Roll call. Vice Mayor Cruz. Here. Council Member Malson. Here. Council Member Campion. Here. Council Member Lamson. Here. Mayor Hewer. Here. Silent prayer followed by a flag salute. Replay statement. This meeting of the Galt City Council will be cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will air Friday, October 19th at 9 a.m. and Saturday, October 20th at 9 a.m. The City Council meeting videos are also archived on the City's website. A DVD copy is available for checkout from any library branch. Agenda approval, additions and or deletions. I'd like to pull item, consent item six. Capital improvements, capital yeah, improvement a, program yeah. status update. Just have a quick question, that's all. Okay. Any further? Okay, presentations. Introduction of new employee, Randy Watkins, Water System Supervisor, Public Works Department. Well, Madam Mayor and Council Members, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Randy Watkins here to my left. Go ahead, step on up. <laughs> um, he's the newest addition to our management team. Uh, he's uh, uh, when Mr. Biznet was promoted uh, to our utilities manager position, that left a huge void and big, big, big shoes to fill in the uh, our water division and uh, Mr. Watkins has stepped up uh, to be that new water system supervisor. Uh, by way of background, he uh, has over 10 years of experience in processing and disposal of hazardous uh, wastewater uh, in addition to wastewater treatment and water treatment uh, as well as distribution of potable drinking water and sewage collection systems. Uh, he comes to us holding uh, grade three water treatment operator and a grade three water distribution uh, certificates as well as a grade two wastewater treatment operator license in hand. So he's multi-talented and uh, um, he uh, uh, also is nearing completion, is working on getting just his hours in place for his grade water, uh, grade four water distribution uh, certificate. So uh, we're very pleased to have that acumen coming on board. Uh, he's previously worked with uh, uh, Department of Corrections at DBI and Tracy, I believe, and uh, working on their water treatment systems there, and uh, Western Hills Water District, uh, City of San Bernardino Municipal Water Department, City of Loma Linda Department of Public Works in their water distribution and water production division. So he uh, has a degree in water supply technology from San Bernardino Valley College, and uh, he focused his studies in municipal water and wastewater treatment. Uh, I, a birdie has told me that he has a career goal of becoming a civil environmental engineer. So he has high aspirations in water treatment and wastewater treatment plants. And in all that spare time I'm sure he has left, he enjoys gourmet cooking and spending time with his family. So we're thrilled to have Mr. Randy Watkins coming on board. And Randy, anything you'd like to say? Yeah, I would like to thank the beautiful community of Guam for welcoming uh, into your team. Like you said, I know I have big shoes to fill, Mr. Biznet. Uh, set the bar pretty high. And uh, as a community, we're growing, the water department is growing. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Lewis isn't here yet, is he? I yeah, can, can we put that? Yeah, we'll go ahead and when he comes. Thank you. Okay, introduction of new canine, Officer Kane. <laughs> Hi, Kane. So I told Officer Little that 
following this, it's been our tradition that the new employees have to come and give a speech afterwards, so I'm sure he's got a good one prepared. <laughs> so I thought it was important that we talk a little bit about Officer Little, why he was uh, selected as our newest uh, dog handler, and then we'll talk about our new canine cane. So Officer Little has been with our department for about five years. He worked as a volunteer while attending the police academy before he transitioned uh, to becoming an officer here. Um, he's previously worked on patrol in the POP team um, and on regional POP efforts. And uh, he has a strong um, connection with our community and he's constantly out there working and everything, which made it a really easy decision to make him our newest uh, canine handler when he applied. So let's talk about uh, our new dog. His name is Kane. He's a one and a half year old uh, um, German Shepherd from the Czech Republic. Uh, he was chosen in August, and right after he was chosen, Officer Little and Kane uh, uh, went to training. Uh, the interesting thing that uh, was was continually stated is that he excelled through training, and uh, um, he's just a natural. This this dog, um, so uh, he moved through training really really quick, uh, handling um, things that usually take dogs about a year to handle um, uh, through the different searches and the different environment that's, environments that they go through. Uh, so now he's certified on patrol and he's also a, um, a certified in narcotics. And uh, he loves, uh, one of the quotes is here is he's, he loves working and is the main attraction at the Pink Patch Project uh, today at the state capitol, which about 150 law enforcement agencies uh, all merged at the capitol today to show off our pink patches and. And uh, Officer Kane was uh, one of the one of the people with the pink patches today. So, anyway, so that's uh, Officer Little and our new canine Kane, and uh, I can't wait to hear this speech. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank uh, oh, you got to up here. Uh, This has been my career goal since I decided to become in uh, law enforcement. Um, cool. so, so it's kind of a you know five years in it's. Uh, I'm very blessed to have that. Kane's been an a awesome uh, addition, not only to my family, but to the department. Uh, he loves walk, finding new pets up and down each room that he goes in, down in the office. Um, and then today, he, uh, he got lots of it. It's, he's been sleeping ever since we got home, so that's why he's a little wound up right now. <laughs> so um, I know he wants to say a couple words, so don't, don't get scared. Yeah. Watch him. Thank you, guys. Okay, that stock presentation, Eric Lewis. I'm going to have uh, Jackie Garcia, our special events manager, come up first. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Tonight, I would like to introduce promoter Eric Lewis from Vet Track Project, who will be providing a brief overview of the Vet Stock concert on, held on September 15th at Veterans Field. Also, around March of 2019, Parks and Rec will be providing a detailed summary to Council in the special event sponsorship funding report based on this event. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, ma'am. see you. I saw you rocking out. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't get to say hi to you. I saw pictures after. I was like, oh, the mayor was there. Um, this year, uh, our event, first and foremost, thank you to the city of Galt. It was amazing. Um, the, the field was so spacious and allowed for people to relax and had plenty of room. Um, park and, parks and rec, top notch. Whatever I needed, they were there. I mean, overly there in front of us. I mean, whatever we needed, if we coughed, you know, they were like giving us napkins, that type of stuff. <laughs> but um, we saved three lives. That's always awesome. I mean, I want to save more, but I, I, it's one of those double-edged swords. I, I hope too many veterans aren't trying to kill themselves, but if, if we hear that, you know, people came up to us like, thank you guys, this event was exactly what we needed, and we're like, you know, we appreciate it, but, you know, City of Galt helped us, so... Um, We've already submitted our package for next year. We hope we can do it again. Hope we get it approved. But um, uh, I, I know a, a couple comments were um, people wish we would have had a better turnout. And every year that we do this, we, we figure out some of our failures. And one of the biggest failure was advertising, which we've already addressed that. And we've got teams of, we've got local uh, consultants here in the city of Galt that uh, want to jump on board with us and help us uh, do a marketing campaign. 
Um, additionally, um, we noticed after we wrapped up, we, we, I guess we had a problem with vagrants um, because mm -hmm. my volunteer committee, we made sure we cleaned up the entire place. And then I was notified by Jackie that trash was just everywhere. And they spent, what was it, two, three hours cleaning up? Two to three hours cleaning up. And I, I don't know what kind of policing that we can do after events like that because, again, my, my committee, we had everything wrapped up. There was no trash anywhere. Um, the only complaint that we had was it wasn't two days. And I was like, that two days would have been enough, <laughs> you know? But um, I do have something to present. This is what we gave to uh, all of our sponsors that were the big ones. So this was signed by Flaw, which is um, one of the military law enforcement big supporters. So we wanted to give that to you guys. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'm going to add something else. I would assume it's not your cup of tea, but I have five CDs, <laughs> and those are um, <laughs> the the CD. And the, one of the important parts about the music is music is therapy. Um, you don't have to be a veteran to have therapy with music because it's a universal language that speaks to all of us, whether it's country, rap, rock, Tejano, any any style of music. Um, one of the songs on there is by the national recording artist Flaw. It's called uh, "Only the Strong." So only the strong survive. And um, all the bands that were on there <coughs> donated their track. And um, nine of them were produced by us, Vet Tracks Project. So um, w again, we're, we're just, um, I, don't even know, I don't have the words to say how pleased we were with the support from the city of Galt. Because again, there's no other place that I'd rather have it because I love the city of Galt. And it's like, it's our little nest egg. I mean, when, when you hear, like something bad happening, I get offended. Like, oh, why are we? Why are people doing this? You know. But again, it, it's amazing, and 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 thank you guys. I know I saw Tom. I saw you there. <laughs> I saw you there, of course. But uh, again, um, from the bottom of my heart, we would not have been able to do it without all of you. So, I'm. I'm well, Eric, thank you for what you do. Because don't okay. ever think it's just three lives. Because one life impacts so many people. It's, yes, it's immeasurable. You know, I spent 40 years in mental health. One life is blessed. Yes, so thank, thank you, you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment. Under Government Code Section 54954.3, members of the public may address the City Council on non-agenda items. The public comment section is for the City Council to receive comments. Except for brief responses to questions, no discussion or action may be taken on any item that is not listed on the agenda. Please limit comments to a maximum of five minutes. Speaker cards are located on the table inside the entrances to the Council Chambers. Once completed, forward the speaker card to the clerk. Those persons wishing to speak on any item scheduled on the calendar on the agenda will be given an opportunity to do so at the time the item is being considered. Reports by city council members on regional boards, commissions, and committees. And Chief Stockman, you attend the criminal justice committee meeting? I do normally, but I did not you attend. You did not this, this time? Week. Okay, thank you. Um, Kurt? Nothing to report tonight. Age? Um, I attended the fire battalion chief, um, it was their CSD meeting and board meeting. They were so excited to have it in this facility. It doesn't happen very often. Donna, how often is it? Twice a year they have it scheduled. Twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, complimented us on how wonderful our facility is. They were very impressed. Um, so that was, that was good. And then Liberty Ranch had their first homecoming in their home stadium, so that was exciting. A lot of the town, it was packed, so a lot of the town was out there. Tom? Uh, in candidate forums, I attended my fifth year high school reunion. That's it. <laughs> Mark? None, thank you. <laughs> and I haven't attended any regional committees this, this last two weeks either. Okay, so we have an information consent calendar. We have a public comment. Um, Julie Clark regarding item four, F4. Good evening, Council and citizens of Galt. I understand that 
this is not, well, it pertains to this uh, uh, information consent calendar item, but it's more just about the topic of the elimination of the EBT uh, system at the Galt market. And I'd like to start by just uh, reading a little page from the USDA letter to different agencies regarding the SNAP program. Supporting local food systems and expanding access to healthy foods for low-income families remains a high priority for FNS. We, we commend states for their continued efforts in this area and are committed to assisting state agencies in meeting the shared goal of successfully serving those in need of food assistance through access to healthy food choices. So I was curious when I heard, I unfortunately wasn't able to attend the Parks and Rec meeting where this was discussed and I heard about it after the fact. So I had done a little research on my own and um, I was a little confused as to why we were paying a company to provide this service when the equipment itself is free. It's provided free to um, markets that wish to use this system. So another quote from this, right now that assistance is coming through the USDA but um, is also supported by mm -hmm. Department of Social Services CalFresh branch. So uh, let's see, note, and this is also an additional note here, states, provide, states that provide such EBT equipment to farmers markets receive reimbursement for allowable administrative expenses at the normal 50% rate. So we have the administrative costs being somewhat reimbursed. We have free equipment, and so I contacted the farmer's market specialist at the California Department of Social Services, and what she said is essentially that the Alchemist program is there to assist farmer's markets in using the software, um, actually having staffing, but it's a nonprofit organization. It's not intended to be a permanent solution, but those type of tasks can be carried out by just an average you know, employee making minimum wage. So a couple points I just wanted to mention is that I understand we've already ended the contract with Alchemist, which, you know, that's all said and done. So that's neither here nor there. The point is that going forward, I think that it's an important thing to pursue all options in beginning the program again. Um, according to the woman that I spoke with today, there is an upcoming WIC um, aspect to this that in 2020 is going to be, you're going to be able to use WIC to, pr to purchase things at these EBT at the markets as well. And not to mention the, the side note at the end of the letter that's in tonight's packet, agenda packet, which says that, seems to conclude that they're, let's see, eliminating this current program will not reduce customers at the market, et cetera, et cetera. So it's interesting to me that we're saying it's not going to reduce the number of customers. However, there are other agencies or ed entities, farmers markets and various places that offer things like market match where a certain amount of money is matched, you know, by half, which increases people's buying power. So that certainly would be a draw to a family that has to support, you know, people on a very limited income budget. So thinking more long range, the impact on local families who will no longer be able to use this to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables, and I don't know about you, but go to a standard market and okay, I go to Trader Joe's, I'm not gonna lie, and it's a dollar for an apple. So, you know, any other standard market, you're going to have to pay a lot more for produce that you could get much more inexpensively locally. And then the impact on local farmers and just impact on overall market sales. So I'm just curious where the data is that supports this conclusion that eliminating this will not impact the customer base or future revenue. So that's, that's pretty much my questions. And then I also have some data here about from the USDA regarding the authorized farmers markets and how many have, how, what the increase has been over time. So they started doing this program in 2012. Since that time, it went from 262 markets that started off to almost 600 markets statewide, which is a 128% increase. And uh, so going forward, I think it's going to be a, a very important thing that we try to re-establish this offering to customers and to help our local families and farmers and help people eat healthy and live longer and cost less in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Armando, is it possible to get that data to her at a later time? What data is she asking for? Ms. Clark, what, what data? Um, data regarding uh, what, what, con what data was used to form the conclusion that the staff has come to according to this 
document for tonight's meeting that says eliminating the this service will not impact excuse me will not reduce customer there is no written data it's my 30 years experience okay. in the flea market field okay thank you okay information consent calendar minutes of the regular meeting of october 2nd file and receive and file warrant warrants for period ending october 3rd authorize city manager to execute an agreement with adaptive insights inc for budget software subscription services electronic benefit transfer rate adjustment to galt market produce row vendors Galt Arno Cemetery District Equipment Request for Dia de los Muertos event. Mm -hmm. um, capital Improvement Project Status. Oh, no, we pulled that item, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Pulled that item. Tre um, Treasurer's Report for period ending August 2018. Do I have a motion? Moved. I'll second. I have a motion by Council Member Campium, second by Council Member Molson. Call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz. Aye. Council Member Molson? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lamson? Aye. Mayor Hewer? Aye. Motion passes by the vote. Capital Improvement Program Status Update, July 1st to September 30th, 2018. Tom? Yeah, my quick question. Um, I'm reading over this, um, kind of jumped out at me. We're planning an online portal for our water meter readings for our customers so they can actually look at it themselves real time? Mm -hmm. That's correct, and that was envisioned over two years ago when we uh, began the project, and that was part of the original contract was to provide those services to the city. Okay, and it's, it's still sort of on track. It's my understanding they're kind of in the uh, validation stage right now, which... Uh, Having gone through some of that in the software development, I understand it could be rocky. Uh, they have had some challenges with programming and, and yeah. importing data and making sure that the, the billing system is properly talking to the, uh, uh, the, the water data uh, set that is uh, collected by a third party and then that that all is uh, coming together with the information that's in the billings. Um, we are danger close. Uh, Danger. To use a term of art uh, to uh, like finally it. having that beta testing no phase completed. Uh, we're doing some final uh, uh, data checking and uh, yeah. hope to do a soft launch within the next month or two, certainly by the end of the year. Uh, soft launch would be we would we would put it on our website with instructions and encourage folks to try it out. And if that all seems to be working uh, uh, for those that are able to do that, then we would uh, do sort of a hard launch and put a notice out to all five thousand of our residential customers as to that opportunity and it certainly is also going to be available to our commercial customers and at some point i imagine at that time we'll probably have a presentation where you can actually walk us through it uh, i'm sure that could be arranged yeah okay that was my only question i, I don't think the public really probably up to this point even had a clue that we were going that route. So eventually that, that this would happen. So eventually they'll be able to go online and see how much water they're using. And yeah, they can uh, just to highlight a few of the things that we'll be rolling out is not only will they be able to go in and look at real time usage uh, rather than waiting two months for a bill that might be a surprise, they can actually go in and see what they used in the last week, the last month or the last two month uh, billing cycle. They'll also have up to a year's worth of history so they can kind of compare how we're doing this May with how we did the previous May, a little bit like your, your energy bills will often have that comparator. Um, and uh, uh, they'll have the ability to also set alerts if they want to set a, when they reach a certain amount of water usage. Uh, and a, a great functionality uh, be cool. uh, that we are, are, will be making available is um, the ability to request uh, leak detection alerts where if your meter senses continuous usage for a period of 24 or 48 hours, um, then there's an indication there could be a leak or something's running. And you can actually have the system send you an email to that effect. So you can check on that without waiting two months to find out. I got one of those from my mother's house in Sacramento. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's good to have. That was my only question. With that, I'll, I'll move to approve. I have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Motion by Council Member Molson, second by Vice Mayor Cruz. 
Call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz. Aye. Council Member Molson. Aye. Council Member Campion. Aye. Council Member Lamson. Aye. Mayor Hewer. Aye. Motion passes 5 0 vote. Schedule matters. Subject South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan. Mr. Arias. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I'm pleased and it's my pleasure tonight to present to you the South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan. You'll hear me refer to it as either the SSHCP or HCP, but it's all the same thing. The SSHCP had its roots in the mid-1990s, so this is a great success story to finally have this item uh, to you tonight. Let's turn it on. Uh, we'll be asking the council tonight to conduct a public hearing, adopt a resolution certifying the environmental impact report and the federal environmental impact statement, also which adopts the sequel findings of facts, formally adopting the SHCP and the aquatic resource plan and the nexus study. We'll also ask the council to introduce and waive the first reading on the aquatic protect protection ordinance and the mitigation fee ordinance, as well as then adopting the implementing ordinance. The HCP is a regional effort that will provide development and infrastructure projects with a streamlined, predictable federal and state permitting process while creating a preserve system to protect habitat, open space, and agricultural lands. An approved HCP allows project proponents within a plan area to simplify and expedite the state and federal endangered species permitting process. The SSHCP provides a more effective process for protecting natural resources as compared to the current method of a project-by-project project, um, basis. Um, the project-by-project project mitigation often results in small, isolated preserves rather than an interconnected uh, set of preserves. Uh, also, the HCP, in addition to the interco interconnected preserves, will um, sustain them in perpetuity, and it'll ensure an adequately funded management program for the uh, preserves. Other agencies participating in the plan include Sacramento County, the City of Rancho Cordova, the Sacramento Regional uh, County Sanitation District, Sacramento County Water Agency, and the Capital Southeast Connector, JPA. The plan area encompasses 317,656 acres in the southern portion of Sacramento County, including portions of unincorporated Sacramento County, the City of Galt, and the southern half of Rancho Cordova. The plan also includes about 35,000 acres of plan preserves within that plan area. And this plan area is defined as the area in which all conservation actions will be implemented and where all incidental take will occur. The HCP will allow plan permittees to receive an incidental take permit for activities and projects uh, they conduct. Incidental take is generally defined as direct or indirect harm to a species, including habitat loss, which is incidental to land development or public infrastructure projects. The HCP will build upon existing preserves in the plan area, and this is a good, um, this is a good map to view. You can see the existing preserves shown in the green area, and there are some larger um, preserves in it, but you also see some smaller uh, preserves, which you know, part of the plan will um, look to uh, eliminate or at least reduce. You could also see a pretty significant green belt between City of Galt and Elk Grove. And also, I think what this map shows is that the urban development area most affected, and actually the lands that are most affected, are within Sacramento County. So uh, Sacramento County has done the heavy lifting in the creation of the SSHCP, considering that they're impacted uh, the most. They were the lead agency certifying the environmental documents. The EIS and the EIR concluded that the project as submitted was the superior um, alternative, and there were no significant unavoidable impacts. There are no mitigation measures identified as a result of this program. And as you would imagine, uh, there's expected benefits to biological and aquatic resources. Uh, the program has certain components, and one is the aquatic resources program. The permit strategy other program will provide protection priority to save, again, larger aquatic systems and not isolated wetlands. The program streamlines the permitting process consistent with the Clean Water Act Section 404 permits and 401 certifications. And the purpose of the protection ordinance is to establish 
uh, locally implemented permit process to administer requirements in the Aquatic Resources Program. It includes procedures for review of applications for HCP covered activities. The intent is to achieve a no net loss of aquatic resource function and services. The implementing agreement uh, specifies the res responsibilities of each party and how the plan permittees will ensure that the HCP conserv conservation strategy will be implemented. It also uh, identifies how reporting and enforcement procedures will be carried out by the local agencies. It also ensures that all parties understand the responsibilities within the SSHCP. The mitigation fee ordinance provides the mechanism for the collection and disbursement of the HCP mitigation fees. The fees were derived from the Project Nexus study, uh, which was consistent with the Mitigation Fee Act. And it should be noted that uh, the amount of the mitigation fee will be established separately by resolution, um, and that will have to be approved separately and also approved by the South Sacramento Conservation Agency. And that group is scheduled to meet in a couple weeks. Uh, this slide shows the history of the HCP, at least as it pertains to GALT, and a couple key dates are uh, when the city actually approved our participation in the HCP. Also, uh, the city council approved the Joint Powers Authority setting up the South Sacramento Conservation Agency. And earlier this year, the Planning Commission recommended that the city council approve uh, the plan. And of course, the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors approved the HCP last month. And Rancho Cordova had this item presented to the City Council last night, and they approved it uh, unanimously. The City of Galt benefits greatly by participating uh, in the program. It will help streamline development and infrastructure projects, and it creates a stronger preserve system. And it's consistent with the City's general plan. We actually have a general plan policy, LU. 1.10, which specifically states that the city shall work with Sacramento County on the creation of the uh, South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan. We also have another policy, uh, LU-9.1, which states that the, the city should start looking at ways to create uh, open space, agricultural buffers, and conservation easements basically between the, the city of Elk Grove and our northern uh, urban boundary. Uh, before I conclude uh, the presentation, uh, I'd really like to thank Sacramento County for their efforts on this. Again, they've done all the heavy lifting. Uh, you know, we're grateful to be a part of it, and in particular, Leanne Moffitt and Kim Hudson have been great help to staff. And then also, uh, the HCP consultant, Bill Zebron, has been of great assistance, and I think some of you have kind of touched bases with him over the last couple of days. I'd also like to thank Elizabeth Sparkman uh, with Rancho Cordova, and then Galt staff Kristen Bitts and Armin Lobo for helping put this uh, package to you together tonight. Um, and although Rich Rodmacher is no longer with Sacramento County, he certainly deserves recognition for the work he put in uh, and getting this project to this point. So he's no longer with the county, but he's probably the, the, the person that did the most amount of work to get this project uh, to you today. So, as a reminder, uh, we're asking the council tonight to adopt a resolution certifying the EIR and the EIS, adopting the CEQA findings of fact, formally adopting the SSHCP and the Aquatic Resources Plan as well as the Nexus study, and then asking you to introduce and waive the first reading of the Aquatic Protection <coughs> Ordinance and the Mitigation Fee Ordinance, and then also uh, adopting the implementing resolution. And so that concludes uh, staff presentation, staff and uh, Stack County staff uh, will be available to help answer any questions you might have. I guess I'll start off. For the benefit of our audience, okay, what's the process now for a developer to come to town and have to mitigate something based on his EIR? So the current process is developers are required to go and locate either an existing mitigation bank and purchase credits or if they can't find one, then they're required to create one. And so that can be a cumbersome process. It, yes, it can. It takes time and it can be costly. So, you know, as mentioned, you know, the goal of this program will be to help streamline that. So Correct. instead of that current process, they will essentially be going in and paying a fee. And they can still use the old process if they wanted to. Well, there is a mechanism for donation of land. Correct. 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 Yeah. As long as it is appropriate with uh, HCP. Uh, right. 
requirements. And so essentially, it's, it, yeah, they can, yeah, and they do have options, okay. Mm -hmm. Hope it's a little clearer for our audience what we're trying to accomplish here. <laughs> it's a long time coming. I think it's great for the city and it's uh, streamlining the, the, the process for it. Yeah. And not just for development. I think sometimes the overlooked component is for larger public works projects, they will often have mitigation requirements too. That's true. So it's been a struggle in the past for public works to go out and search and find these. And we've had to create our own programs in the past and we have an existing preserve because of that. So this will also help infrastructure projects as well. Thank you. Questions? Mark? No, I just, you've already answered my question. It would, basically what it's doing is instead of having the developer go out and look for the funds and look for the money, or, excuse me, <clears throat> look for the land for, for mitigating purposes, that bank is gonna be created, not just for ourselves, but all that are involved. That's correct. Any questions? No, I was just going to make a comment. I mean, it, it, uh, you know, I, I worked on this project, you know, 10, 12 years ago, and I am just very pleased to see that it's actual, actually come to a reality because oh of the benefits it does provide to the development community mm -hmm. as well as public agencies, including the city of Galt. I mean, it is uh, something that will expedite projects, both public and private, uh, because you are not having to find lands to mitigate uh, whatever potential impact you have. And, and it's not only finding the, finding the land to mitigate it, then it has to meet the criteria of the permitting agency. Mm -hmm. So instance, Hawk, you know, yeah. you've got to be within a certain number of miles of where the impact occurs. Be so if you find area. something outside that cone or circle, uh, it doesn't do you any good. So I mean, th this is something that, that, that I think will really, uh, in the long term, benefit not only the city of Galt, but Sacramento County and any of the participating jurisdictions. And I think that's a good point where my experience uh, the last few years has been that land is getting harder and harder, harder to find harder. within that distance. So, yes, it is. Uh, it could get to a point where we make it even more difficult for development and public works projects. Yes. And then it's finding, you know, willing property owners to, to work with the easements or you have to outright purchase it. And outright purchases mm -hmm. uh, are sometimes uh, significantly higher cost than purchasing an easement. So, I mean, it's, uh, it uncomplicates a very complicated process the way it currently is. So. Well, I just thought that it was great when I, t I attended the, sac um, the county presentation um, with Chris, and I just think it's great to see all segments of, of yeah. groups <laughs> that are concerned about development and concerned about, about land usage come together and be able to all support this plan. So I think that's, that happens so rarely, it seems like in government, that everybody can come together and agree on it. So I'm gonna open the public hearing. Do we have any public comment? Close the public hearing. Okay, we're going to adopt each one of these separately, so I need a motion for each one of the items unless we have further discussion. I would make a motion. And make a mo we have to make a motion on each separate item. That's correct. Yep. <laughs> I'd rec uh, make a motion to adopt the resolution certifying the environmental uh, statement, impact report, adopting the Environmental Quality Act, findings of fact, adopting the South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan, and adopting the South, Sa South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan Nexus Study. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion by Council Member Campion, second by Vice Mayor Cruz. Call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz. Aye. Council Member Molson. Aye. Council Member Campion. Aye. Council Member Lamson. Aye. Mayor Hewer. Aye. Motion passes, 5-0 vote. Make a motion to introduce and waive the first reading and read only by title. An ordinance adopting chapter 15.3, sections 15.3.010 through section 15.3.110. Uh, to Title 15 of the Galt Municipal Code regarding aquatic resource protection. I have a motion. Uh, a second. I have a motion by Council Member Campion, second by Council Member Molson. Call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Molson? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lamson? Aye. Mayor Hewer? Aye. Motion passes, 5 0 vote. Make a motion to adopt resolution. <laughs> She's going to keep it rolling. Requirements for implementation of the South Sacramento Habitat <laughs> Conservation Plan. I'll second. I have a motion by Council Member Campion, second by Council Member Molson. Call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Molson? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. 
Council Member Lamson? Aye. Mayor Hewer? Aye. Motion passes, 5 0 vote. Make a motion to introduce and waive the first reading read uh, by title only at ordinance adopting chapter 1532, Adam. sections 1532.0.10 through 1532.100 uh, to title 15 of the Galt Municipal Code regarding establishment of mitigation fees for the South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan. Second. A motion by Councilmember Campion, second by uh, Councilmember Lampson. Call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz. Aye. Council Member Molson. Aye. Council Member Campion. Aye. Council Member Lamson. Aye. Mayor Hewer. Aye. Motion passes 5 0 vote. And thank you so much for coming and coming down today. Do thank you, you all anything? very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for all of the time and the work. And we're really looking forward to it. Thank you. It's great. Thanks. Okay. Regular calendar Parks and Rec Department, subject Galt Senior Resource Center. Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council, Armando Solis, Parks and Rec Director. On July 28th, the Commission on Aging voted to approach city, uh, the City and City Council on establishing a senior resource center. Uh, you can see their proposal in the staff report as an attachment. Uh, Mayor Hewer, City Manager, and myself met with Chairman Bob Belay and Commissioner Alvin Roberts uh, to get a better understanding of what their needs truly were. At that meeting, after that meeting, uh, I took uh, Bob and Alvin to the Shibola Center to show them a couple of options um, of where they could house this resource center. And uh, the final decision that they had uh, selected was the southeast corner of the Shibola Center. As you walk in through the doors, you have the storage rooms on both sides. They want the one closest to the Parks and Rec Department. Uh, there are some items in there now. Uh, there's a uh, storage for Meals on Wheels, and the city has some uh, items in there. Uh, there are some cabinets that need to be removed, uh, and a fresh coat of paint will need to be done to that area to make that an office. Uh, in the request, they asked for um, a desk, chairs, um, computer, and uh, brochure, brochure holders, which the city currently has in surplus, so we can bring that over. Um, Hard cost to turn that into a, into an office would be uh, paint, cordless phone, signage, printer, and office supplies, totaling about a thousand dollars. Soft costs would be the demolition of the cabinets, painting, and moving the surplus office, uh, office <coughs> furniture, equaling about six hundred dollars in soft costs. Uh, with that said, staff is recommending that council review the request by the commission on aging regarding the creation of a Galt Senior Resource Center and provide direction to staff. Uh, Chairman Ballet is in the, in the audience, and uh, Commissioner Roberts is also there. I'd answer any questions if you have any now or allow Mr. Ballet to talk. It's my understanding this is well within their, their uh, existing budget, right? No, we would, we would need $1,000 to, okay. uh, to paint, remove, and uh, buy a printer and those type of things. My intention is if this is approved by the council tonight at the next meeting, I will allocate my discretionary funds to this project. I feel like I talk you into it. <laughs> anyway, I, I just wanted to, to, to um, this kind of came about because um, I met with the Commission on Aging and we had a speaker come from um, the Senior Center in Elk Grove. And, one of the things after listening to her speak was I realized that one of the things that when she talked about um, one of the, the things that they utilize at the Senior Center in Elk Grove was that we didn't really have a resource center. And she really talked a lot about, the director there talked a lot about um, the part the resource center played to seniors in their community and families of seniors to be able to um, direct people to um, resources in the community or in the county or even within the state. And so um, I worked with the, I've suggested to the commissioners and kind of been working with the chair regarding the fact of being able to establish this. So I really appreciate Parks and Rec putting the time in because I think it's something that could really benefit seniors and their families and our community of having a place to go, whether it's the death of a loved one, whether it's, you know, we were talking, whether it's, you know, dealing with a, you know, a, a parent as they're aging, 
lots of resources, and there's resources out there, and sometimes I think because we're so isolated in our little island from the county that it's hard to get the resources down here. So they were really proposing to man it with volunteers and to be able to um, see if we can provide that services to seniors in our community. And, and I think this is a great location that we hold the Meals on Wheels program, the senior club, um, special interest classes for the seniors. So I think it's a good location for it. I appreciate that, Armando. Mr. Belay, would you like to say something? Yes, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Mayor Hewer and uh, council members, thank you very much for listening to our proposal. I was going to start out by saying we have a dream, but I'm ne <laughs> not nearly that great of a person to make that kind of a speech. So I'll, I'll, I'll limit myself to repeating what the mission of this of this particular resource center would be. And that is to be available, this resource center is to be available to members of the senior population of the city of Galt, either in person, by email or by phone, to answer questions or provide information about the various resources available within our city or nearby cities such as Elk Grove or Lodi that are specific to seniors. The hours of operation we envision the uh, commission envisions is Monday through Friday, uh, through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. staffing that office once it's once it's opening up, and we anticipate that to open up hopefully with your support. Um, you know, children and uh, seniors kind of pull at our heartstrings. Most of us, if not all of us, have kids. Most of us, well, all of us have parents. Uh, some of them are still alive, hopefully, and others are not. But in any case, it pulls at our heartstrings. So when I have a meeting with seniors in my immediate community at Three Pounds Mobile Estates, I brought up the issue of the 211 Center, for example, in Sacramento, South Sacramento. I've been visiting there, been working with them over the last several months, and I asked my fellow, my neighbors, I go, how many of you know what the 211 Center does? Or have you even heard of it? Not one hand went up. And I think Mayor Hewer can attest to that. So that tells me that we have some work to do to let our seniors know what's available. And while we can't open up another senior center like they have in Elk Grove, it started out in the garage. Okay, our senior center starts out in an office that is now actually used to store things. It's a storage room. So that could be a garage. And it could develop into our own senior center so that our seniors in this community, and we have many seniors in our community, don't have to go off to Elk Grove or to Lodi to avail themselves of services. So we can start out small, as Mayor Hewer so rightfully suggested, when she, met a, when she met with our commission a few months back. And I really, really want to take this opportunity to thank you, Mayor Hewer, for your interest. Also, Eugene uh, Palazzo, I thank you for your part in this. And above all, certainly uh, not last, <laughs> would be uh, your input, Director Solis. So hopefully this dream that our commission has will come to fru fruition at least in terms of having an office where people can go, elderly people can go, get information, and plan their uh, futures in the city of Galt. Thank you for your support. Thank you. So, Mr. Bellet, yes. one of the questions I had you answered about when um, you're going to be open, are you staffing it with volunteers? Yes, we, uh, we, we intend to staff it with volunteers. We have someone on the commission, uh, Penny Niemeyer, that has already vol volunteered to train the, the, uh, the volunteers. And the way we would like to go about getting volunteers is by advertising through the uh, news um, newsletter newsletter that goes throughout the city. Sure. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Settles, for uh, your cooperation in this as well. Because we once we go out, we should have it. We don't really need many people because, I mean, I, I'm retired. And depending on what happens on the 6th of November, I may have lots more time, <laughs> or not, to, uh, to invest uh, some, some of my time in staffing that office as well. And I can count on some of my fellow commissioners to do the same. So we, but we are asking for volunteers. And the volunteers, is regardless of age, of course, they have to be 
you know, adults, obviously, but uh, they don't have to be old. They, you know, they, ca they can be young. And uh, they can be young in their minds, or they can just be young, period. Mm -hmm. Or they can be old, whatever. Anyway, so that, that's how we're going to get our volunteers. Well, that's wonderful. Very exciting. Any other questions? No, oh, thank you. Again, thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Roberts, do you have anything to add? Nope. nope. Okay. <laughs> so, Armando, this is startup costs. Now, we would probably have to come back next year and look at ongoing costs because there, there will be some ongoing costs for paper and those kinds of things probably in the future if it's... We, we were hoping that those minimal costs would, could be absorbed in the current budget okay. that the Commission on Aging has. Okay, what, no. the, the startup costs will be... You know, what what they are you're talking paper toner so and i know when we met um we discussed even in and the commission the commissioners talked about looking at um at getting um, donations from the community that there are a lot of community members and community organizations that that do work to support seniors and that we might be able to get some donations in the future to help with some of the ongoing costs okay any further questions? So we just need to give direction to staff? Please. So do we have any direction? Any concerns? Well, I think some of the direction can be that staff return then with the with Mayor Hewers, as I understood that you would want to bring back the next meeting, the use of your discretionary funds mm -hmm. towards the Senior Center and any uh, budget adjustment that might be necessary to the Commission on Aging's a budget based on those proposed uh, improvements listed in the staff report. So moved. We have a second. A second. <laughs> moved by Mayor Hewer, second by Council Member <coughs> Molson. <laughs> Call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz. Aye. Council Member Molson. Aye. Council Member Campion. Aye. Council Member Lamson. Aye. Mayor Hewer. Aye. Motion passes 5 0 vote. Thank you. Public Works Department, approval of the final map and subdivision improvement agreement for River Oaks 3C. Madam Mayor and Council Members, uh, Mr. Bill Forrest will make a brief presentation. Uh, we are recommending tonight that we do uh, reach the final step with the River Oaks subdivision and approve uh, subdivision agreement and their final map uh, for Phase 3C. Phase 3C, Mr. Forrest. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good evening. Mayor Hewer and council members, I'm Bill Forrest, senior civil engineer with the Public Works Department. Once I get a button to work. There we go. Uh, River Oaks 3 was originally approved in 2004. Uh, the 2004 approval included splitting uh, the project into three phases. River Oaks 3C is the third and final phase of the development. Uh, construction on River Oaks 3C began in June of 2018, um, starting in late uh, June uh, when they obtained the core permit, uh, they jumped over and uh, closed and worked on Marengo Road and uh, reopened it uh, soon after. Uh, we particularly wanted them to do the work, that work during uh, summer vacation for schools. And uh, with a strong effort on uh, behalf of Elliott Homes and the contractors and the city of Galt, uh, that goal was uh, nearly achieved. Uh, we were like two days late. Uh, this is uh, River Oaks 3C, uh, approximately this was the middle phase, the second phase, 3B, and 3A, uh, which was uh, one of the first projects, uh, acceptance of that project was one of the first projects uh, I worked on when I first came to the city. Um, so what you have is extension of uh, Ripken Avenue, uh, Cepeda Way, uh, DiMaggio Way, and a couple other. I uh, refer to this as the baseball subdivision, uh, in that majority of the street names are named after 
famous uh, baseball players. Um, improvements done to date. Uh, in 2017, uh, the city uh, planning commission approved a, a map amendment which changed the uh, bridge across, I refer to as Denman's Gulch tributary uh, over this is Norbury Way in the uh, existing River Oaks uh, 2B development and uh, process a map amendment to change that from a vehicular bridge to a pedestrian bike bridge. Uh, other improvements, uh, this is the drainage tributary itself. Um, uh, this is uh, not particularly exciting. It's your, uh, average channel, so to speak, uh, widened and cleaned out. Uh, downstream of the bridge, uh, there's a splitting of the flow, creating upland habitat in the center, and, um, and that work uh, was done underneath uh, a U.S. Army Corps 404 permit, which they had to obtain their mitigation <laughs> uh, prior to the... Uh, um, this is showing uh, the improvements along Moringa Road. The sound wall is up. Uh, right now we have two lanes of vehicular traffic. Um, you can see the curb and gutter has been poured. This is just north of the uh, UPR spur railroad tracks. Uh, this is the entrance uh, Cepeda Way off of Marengo into the uh, project uh, didn't take pictures, but interior um, uh, the curb and gutter and sidewalk has been poured. Uh, the streets have been rocked uh, by necessity. All the underground utilities, water, sewer, um, storm drainage, uh, the, the the dry utilities, smud, all that's been installed. Uh, one of the additional um, aspects of development is there used to be uh, power poles along Marengo Road and uh, all that has been underground. Uh, all that is left is a pole serving the existing residents who uh, lives on the east side of Marengo Road and north of the railroad tracks and then there's a smud substation uh, on the west side of Marengo Road and so there's a pole associated with that. Uh, before you is the subdivision improvement agreement. And uh, in the subdivision improvement agreement, it uh, uh, gives an option, a provision to uh, defer slightly the construction of the UPR crossing improvements, which is a new rail bed new tracks, new signals. Um, as most people are aware, dealing with the railroad is a long uh, process. Uh, I remember meeting with them, uh, I believe it was fall of 2016, to uh, discuss these improvements. So the subdivision improvement agreement gives a uh, option uh, to allow work to progress with the UPRR um, crossing improvements and then uh, gives an option of deferring pavement of the pedestrian bike trail, which backing up, runs from Marengo Road along the north side of Ripken on the south side of the drainage uh, tributary and continues all the way across the north um, side of 3B and 3A and ties into a uh, trail that was built with a well site in 2005-2006. Uh, so uh, this is the crossing, pedestrian crossing. So right now the proposal is to pave the bike trail from Kaling Court where there's a ramp all the way out to Moringa Road and then the pavement uh, bike trail up to the pedestrian bike bridge. Um, the, the reason for the deferral is that 
the Liberty Ranch Eastview development on the east side of Marengo, uh, their trunk sewer goes along uh, that open space and essentially will be underneath the, that bike trail. And it was uh, hopefully to give them enough time to um, get the work done and so we're Elliot Holmes and their contractor doesn't pay the bike trail and then we tear it out six months later for development, uh, proposed development on the Eastview side. Um, give you a little time frame. Uh, the Eastview development I believe was approved in 2015. Uh, what I have heard from the engineering uh, group is that they're looking to um, start masquerading in April of 2019. That is dependent upon um, them getting a U.S. Army Corps permit for the channel work. Um, the plans for the sewer have, have been designed, but they have not been submitted to the city for uh, review and approval. Uh, and then uh, there was a condition in the uh, uh, conditions of approval that gave a fee credit for the railroad crossing improvements um, as uh, the permit, uh, encroachment permit from the railroad is under, we decided to bring, we'll be bringing that before the council at a later date um, when we had more uh, concrete time frames. So the recommendation is uh, one, approve the final map for River Oaks 3C and authorizing the filing and recordation thereof, and then authorize the city manager to execute the subdivision improvement agreement. And I'm available for any questions. Real quick one, the uh, railroad crossing, that doesn't qualify for a quiet zone, does it? I, I don't think you have the site distance. Um, also, I think uh, given the the frequency of traffic, yeah, it's not warranted. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't been studied or proposed as a quiet zone, but it has very little traffic. Yeah, very little traffic, and I, I don't think you have the the visibility either down both sides of the track for one, because all the sound walls and everything. Nor the time to deal with Union Pacific. Why? Why was there a decision yeah. to wait until the forty first permit regarding the bike path? Um. Elliott Homes has a kind of a home building phasing schedule and, and working with them, you know, how many permits do they anticipate to build out and whatnot. Um, the 41st was to hopefully get us to that, close to that April 2019 timeframe. The timing guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right now, the home building phasing plan is they're going to start south. That's their first approximately about 20 units, move to the middle, and then the north will be their last home building phase. I, I if I may, um, okay, go ahead. I, I had talked to the city manager today. <clears throat> I had a couple questions on this particular issue because I, I look at it um, a little differently, and I, and I understand staff's point of view not wanting to construct a public facility and then six months later maybe come in and tear it out. It makes it look like the city doesn't know, you know, the city's left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. I completely get that. The concern I have though is that we are putting uh, um, Elliott Homes in a position, the residents of the subdivision in a position, and future residents of that subdivision, they're having to wait on the action of a third party that has absolutely no interest in this subdivision. Um, the East Area Project, um, I don't know that it has met any of the deadlines that have been set forth here recently. I don't really know where they are in the process other than, you know, you indicate they have plans, but you haven't seen them. So maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, they still have to get the 404 permit, which can be up to a year easily. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I don't think that the residents nor Elliott should be held hostage. Uh, in a sense, to finish out these improvements. I mean, it's a bike trail that connects 
schools, school facilities, as well as the park facilities. That's certainly a benefit to the residents of that subdivision to have that trail completed. Um, it's part of the subdivision improvement agreement, um, and I think that it should probably go ahead with the understanding that another developer may be res responsible for reconstructing it at a future date. Uh, but I don't think that the residents of the subdivision nor Elliott should be held up. I think secondly, or thirdly, to postpone the paving, and I, I defer to Mr. Mr. Walker on this, they're going to have to have, I would believe, mobilization costs associated with bringing in the asphalt because they're going to pave their streets out first before they can get building permits. So all that paving is going to be done. Then to mobilize again and bring asphalt back in is going to be an additional cost. And I don't know if that's substantial. I don't, I don't have any idea. Uh, I mean, the construction manager for Elliott Homes is actually uh, working up those numbers uh, and, um, and will be presenting that. Uh, to me, but yes, uh, you know the 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 paving is expected to be done uh, early November, possibly you know depending on weather, all the way uh, into end of November, and so yes, they're they're going to be paving everything at that point in time, and so there is a cost to Elliott Homes potentially to have George Reed the contractor to remobilize to finish out yeah. the rest of the paving. Uh, uh, one thing I should also mention is that uh, the portion of the trail that's uh, to the uh, west of the pedestrian bridge, we are going to have them rock it. And so there'll be a firm surface, not a paved surface, but a... Uh, a uh, well, and, and I understand that, but I mean, even at that, they rock it, then they may have to go back in and do additional subgrade work in order to put down the pavement at a future date. So it, I think it creates more of a liability on their part rather than a, it creates a benefit to the subdivision of, of, uh, to a certain degree, but um, <coughs> I guess I, I, I just don't, <coughs> we have no promissory commitment by the East area that they're going to get this done. So therefore, I don't see why the city would hold up improvements that otherwise benefit the subdivision. I, I, I'd like to hear from Mr. Mr. Walker too, because I, you know, I, I don't know what the difference is. I don't know what their their interest is, but I think uh, I share Councilman Campion's concerns that oh. the existing residents have been waiting for that bike path to connect. We're doing the improvements along Morango. Kids will be able to use those to go to, to walk to schools, to walk to the. The park. So to the parks, holding it up, waiting for the Eastview project, which we don't know when that's going to come online and when they're going to do anything out there. To hold that up for those residents that have already moved into those homes, the ones that are going to be moving in those homes, to be able to not have that amenity that they need, I share your concern that I think that, you know, Depending on what, I mean, I'd like to hear what the applicant has to say. And I well, we'll certainly the let the applicant speak. Just a couple points sure. of clarification. We're not requiring them to defer those improvements. We're giving them the option. Uh, in any event, they would have to be paved within the one year uh, as all improvements must be completed with or without Eastview, certainly within a year. The thought would be to provide a compacted all-weather surface uh, that wouldn't require undo and redo, certainly if it is paved early and then is torn up, there will be a loss of use of that bike trail while that work is going on. And so, uh, and last point would just be that uh, if indeed they're going to sort of a, a start improvements at the south and work to the north, uh, the thought is that the bike trail will be in before there's any contiguous development up against that bike trail. Um, uh, there would still be a way through to the bridge, and then they could go north on the bridge. So those were, that was, staff thought was to provide flexibility. Sure. If the two developers could work out an arrangement or a deal or a cost offset, uh, that we'd provide that flexibility within the agreement, but not a requirement yeah. that they do that. Well, I wasn't sure because the, the, what, it, what it states on the, the written part, it says that defer paving uh, of the trail until the 41st building permit. In here it says uh, delay it. Uh, it says which shall be completed prior to the issuance of. So there was an inconsistency. So I thought maybe there was another change. 
Yeah, our, our PowerPoint is more of a summary. Uh, the conditions that are in the agreement would apply. Okay. And, and it would have to be started prior to the 41st building. Which could be tomorrow. Could be tomorrow. Yeah, I, and I understand that. So I wasn't going to argue that point, but it, it didn't, at this point, it, it made it look as though we were going to wait until the 41st, at least on the PowerPoint, the way I read that. Anyway, I, I'd like to hear from Mr. Uh, Walker. Walker, if anybody else has, doesn't have any questions. Have you been in communication with the with the East View? Well, like it, uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, before moving forward with this proposal, I frankly I I wanted some some uh, piece of information from, and like I said, I communicated with the engineering group uh, Wood Rogers for the East View Liberty Ranch development, and I said, you know. The, the developer's applicant said they'd be turning dirt the year after approval, which was two years ago. Yeah, uh, they haven't met. So, you know, and, you know, again, not wanting to hold up uh, Elliot Holmes because, uh, you know, issuance of building permits was tied to the completion of the bike trail. And I was, you know, I was trying to, you know, work out a deal that could be mutually beneficial, but as Steve mentioned, this is just really to give an option. Um, like I said, you know, uh, they're looking at the costs and LA Homes may, you know, know what? You know, same kind of thing. You know, I have no, you know, expectation of, you know, recouping my costs from this development group in the short term. I'm just gonna pave it, <laughs> you know, and, you know, they have to deal with the cost, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Walker? Well, unless, unless maybe Elliot would like to put in that sewer main for them <laughs> and get reimbursed at a later date. <laughs> Knew that was coming, right? Um, Price Walker with Elliot Homes. <clears throat> First of all, you know, we, we appreciate it and, and share the same concerns you have. There's, there's no benefit to us to defer this. Um, we're going to be paving in about two weeks and it makes sense, the most sense, both economically and frankly, for the subdivision. The folks to the west are the ones that have been waiting the longest, right. yes. and they're the ones that are gonna be deferred. <clears throat> and so, you know, it makes, from our point of view, sense to, to go ahead and just pave it all. We were working with staff to make sure that in the event, uh, the folks to our east did come forward, it, you know, wouldn't, the questions wouldn't then be asked of both us and staff what the heck are you guys doing? You just paved it, and now it's being torn up. Right. And that's that's really what this came down to. But uh, if it's a pleasure of the council for us to go in and do it all, we will complete it this year, barring, barring weather. Thank you. you know, to the extent that you can, and I appreciate what staff was trying to work out. I think it's, a, and, it, and it makes sense. But I don't think, um, you know, if that can be worked out, if you can work it out with that developer, that's fine. But I don't think it should be at the cost of delaying the improvements to the subdivision that, that I think. And we've had a lot, of, not a lot, but we've had a, several discussions with Wood Rogers, the engineer for the developer. And, you know, they're assuring us that they want to go forward. But wanting to go forward and going forward mm -hmm. isn't the same thing. Um, I'm not sure the current developer is going to build that out or actually looking for someone to, to, to purchase, to, to buy it and do it for them. So in other words, it could be years before we right. actually have to. I, I couldn't give you an answer on that. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Mary, I can add uh, just, you know, staff's been working with the uh, EC uh, developer on uh, forming CFD. That process is moving along, probably a little slower than, than uh, we would like, but we are you know, in discussions with them to, to get that, um, you know, moving forward. It, probably February, March before the council would see anything on that. Um, Mr. Walker, have you reviewed the, the condition uh, 3B um, regarding the um, Installation of the bike trail. I mean, basically, it says, and the way it reads now, you could. Yes, I don't think that was. A, I mean, I, I have. I know that was a correction, because I, I think the way I took it is probably your attorney didn't like the way it was written prior, and, and corrected this. 
I don't know. That's how I interpreted it. I, I don't know. Uh, That's how I, I took it. Always blame the attorney. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yes, it could, we could start it in three weeks or two weeks from now. From now. Okay. I think the intent of it was some type of delay. Let's give the folks to the east of us the, 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 what's the name of the project. East View? East View. Give them some opportunity time, but also allow us the opportunity to get started on the, our, pro, our building program. And that's where that number came from. Um, so I think there was, the intent was some delay to see if they were going to go forward before we built it and then had it torn out. But it, you know, again, if it's the pleasure, we'll, we'll build it. So maybe for clarification, um, we believe that the subdivision agreement as worded provides the option to yep. the developer. If council's firm conviction is we don't want to provide that extra time, we want to see it paved for the benefit of those uh, existing homes that are already there, um, then we could certainly uh, revise that and bring it back uh, sure. with, with the concurrence of the developer uh, and modify that. Or you could uh, direct an amendment and we could affect that change. And I'll defer to the attorney on. I think Steve's correct. I mean, I, I agree. I I'd like to see it paved. <laughs> I'd like to, I think the existing, um, I think the existing homeowners and the future homeowners of 70 homes, I don't think we should be holding it up for Eastview and because East, if Eastview hasn't come forward with a permanent, with a concrete date that says we're going to do it at this date, we've sat, we've gone through this before of having projects sit there and sit there and sit there and nothing happened because. Could be a couple more years or more. Could. Yeah. I, I, and if Elliott Homes is willing to go forward and pave it, and I think that's what. They, they were willing <laughs> to pave it back in June. <laughs> I'd say pave it, but I don't know what the rest of council thinks. So you I need think, a motion on that, Kurt? Uh, I think it would be helpful to have a motion as to the specific amendment to make to the subdivision agreement with that section 3B as far as the timing. It may be something we'll need to work out with the developer, but it would just be a, a clarification that uh, it won't be tied to that the 41st prim rent, that it will be before that date. And as Steve, as Mr. Winkler said, it does already allow that flexibility. It just says they have to start the paving for the bike path before the 40, 41st building permit. So they do have that flexibility in there, and then they have the timelines and the subdivision improvement agreement to already complete those. It just gave them some flexibility to determine whether they wanted to wait to the spring if Eastview was moving. <coughs> if you want to leave it, don't necessarily need an I will, amendment. I will give you my word that we're going to go forward and build it. Yeah, and maybe just again, technical yeah. clarification. The current, the, the tentative map conditions of approval required that it be completed prior to the first permit. And then through the subdivision agreement, we look to create some flexibility right. given those delays. So, uh, a very simple, if everybody's will, was it would be just a by motion strike 3B, and that reverts to the original condition. And they sound like they're ready to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think the timing works. Yeah, we, we're gonna, we're gonna, we gotta, we, yeah, I think it does. We're gonna pay. The, we can't can't pull a permit until we pay the streets, and they're gonna happen at the same time. So it should should be fine. Well, I know there's people waiting for those homes to be built. <laughs> I mean, my only, I guess my only, uh, it shouldn't be any hesitance. I said my only hesitance was gonna be, what if just some, you know, we got the streets paved and it started pouring or something. But I mean, I don't. I, I'm comfortable with leaving B in. Okay. You know, with your assurance. Yeah. And, you know. You, you all know how to find Well, I mean, if you chose to, if the developer, if the other developer came forward and said, yes, we We're really do, do want to work with you, we want to do this, we want to get it done, and had some timelines, then I guess it gives you the flexibility to be able to do that. I mean, I just don't want you waiting till the 41st building permits pulled, and we never hear from the developer that he right. that they wanted to do it. So we've delayed. I can it. assure you we won't. But I'm Fine. That's my concern. Is well, I just don't want to see it delayed for nothing. I mean, if it really was that they were going to come forward and do it this spring, nobody wants to pave something, pull it out six months later, and and the extra cost that it would incur upon Eastview to do that. Yeah, the, the most people don't like doing development services because there's that always that uncertainty. You know, it's like you know, as mentioned, the project proponent for Eastview, you know. 
at the approval, you know, back in 2015, so, oh, yeah, we'll be turning dirt in a year, yeah. you know, and, and it's, um, so. No, because it really does connect in with the walkways and connects in yes. with the bicycle trail and, mm -hmm. and the bridge. I mean, it, it's, it's important that it be done. And riding, you can't really ride bikes, push strollers, and all those things on gravel. <laughs> oh, it's, it's better than uh, a hogged out dirt <laughs> with uh, standing water. So yeah. that's why we made them uh, at least rock that segment. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, Elliot Holmes is willing you know, to do it, you know, for, to get a, you know, building permits as necessary. And, uh, and uh, so it was just an attempt to try to hurt cats, so to speak, uh, to a reasonable solution, but yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, do I have any more discussion? Further questions? No. Do I have a motion? Um, move for approval of the final map for the River Oaks 3C and authorizing the filing of recordation thereof, as well as uh, uh, authorizing the city manager to execute the subdivision agreement with Elliott Holmes and filing and recordation thereof. Oh, I didn't. Well, a second. <clears throat> it's a mouth goes tonight. Do I have a second? I'll yeah. second. A second. I'm second. done already. Okay. Before we vote, was there any public comment? I didn't open public comment. Oh. I apologize. Okay, no public comment. Okay, call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Molson? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lampson? Aye. Mayor Hewer? Aye. Motion passes 5 0 vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Regular calendar. Oh, no. <laughs> Pass that. Communication. <laughs> any communication? I do not have any. City Clerk's report? Nothing tonight. <laughs> Comments by staff. Chris? Um, my two regular standing items have been the HCP and the annexation, so I think I'm down to one. Uh, <laughs> just a reminder, the annexation, uh, I think it's going to be heard by the LAFCO board in December, so that's the first Wednesday in December. So we're looking to get on our agenda. Good. Thank you. Steve? I was just looking for the numbers here. We have the September water conservation report, and it appears that uh, we were, uh, for the month of September, uh, achieving 21% uh, over the previous two-year average from two years prior. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Armando? I'd just like to remind everybody that we're currently taking basketball registrations for our youth program. Uh, we'll be taking registrations till Monday the 22nd with a late fee. And then tryouts will be uh, next week. Just want to remind everyone and invite the public that um, this Saturday at the Littleton Center from five to ten is the Thin Blue or the uh, Blue Angels of Hope Blue Lion Barbecue. Um, we'll have our honor guard there uh, posting the colors, and uh, I'm actually speaking at the event. It's uh, it's absolutely amazing event. I'm, it's it's uh, her first fundraiser. That's uh, Kristen Millard. Um, to help raise funds, which she is the um, Thin Blue Line flag lady. I mean, I, there's no else way to say it. Uh, the most, uh, whenever there's an officer that's injured uh, severely or uh, killed in the line of duty uh, with her own money, she's been sending flags all across the United States uh, to the fallen officers in the departments. And uh, so now it's time for her to start raising some money to help uh, continue that effort. So uh, it's going to be a great event. Nothing to report. Thank you. Yeah. I have nothing further. Thank you. Kurt? Nothing. Paige? Nothing. Tom? Um, Chris was present for my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> or kind of yeah, music. that's a cheap grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I admit it. <laughs> Mark? Three items. You're not off the hook yet. You have two items. You forgot about the cap. I stand corrected. Uh, so let me give you an update on uh, the climate action plan and actually the Carillion Boulevard master plan. So the Carillion Boulevard master plan, we're actually looking at alternatives and we're going to start scheduling some public meetings uh, on that. We're looking at trying to start them the end of this month, beginning of next uh, month. Uh, climate action plan, we're looking at um, 
actual plan parts of the plan and actually measures to support the plan but we're a little bit behind schedule and I think we're going to start rolling that out to the problem to the public probably in about a month or so and then the, the master plan for the um, the market area we're behind schedule on it too we still need to get out with uh, the design consultant and get that started and uh, I'm hoping we can get that done real soon but I don't have a date on that but thank you, Mark. Thanks, so, Chris. I, I appreciate the additional item. I do need that. I'll uh, put it in my, in my group. And Didn't want you to feel unloved. Um, one came off. Add one. Yeah. As far as the Angel Hope dinner, I've been in contact with a lot of retired police officers who are still interested in tickets, so you're going to have a full house. And what I would like to do is next council meeting, I'd like to bring back uh, my discretionary funds to continue the funding for the military banner program, please. And that's all I have. I would just like to wish all of our directors happy Bosses Day. We couldn't do it without you guys. <laughs> so I know the chief was publicly recognized on Facebook, but all of the rest of you, thank you for what you do. So meeting adjourned. Did they bring the treats? Right. <laughs>